JF is a very good debater. I feel like Lance is just going to try to laugh at everything and say like, well, this is absurd and not actually respond to anything. But we'll see what happens. Maybe he will impress us. Oh, I just realized what's happened here. I don't think Lance did any actual research on JF. So his whole opening statement was attacking JF for being an alt-right. Also, I try not to throw this word around loosely, believe it or not. But I think even in JF's own words, I think he advocates for a white ethno state. He's at least like openly like an alt-righter. It sounds to me like you really have a problem with welfare but you don't want to say it outright. Oh, no. I <laughs> oh, God, he's not. Oh, no. I mean, I I'm totally fine saying it outright. I take issue with welfare. The level of like prep that you need to get through a debate like this is insane. But a lot of what JF is saying is true, but like the parts that you would argue with him on are, would be very challenging to do without either a significant amount of prep or having like that prerequisite area of study. Even if he said that some genes were causally related to being poor or causally related to being wealthy, that wouldn't necessarily be surprising either. I'm sure that these causal factors probably exist. But the question is, is it true that you accepted a $25,000 donation from Jeffrey Epstein to start uh, your channel? Does he have a plan for uh, certain problems that I perceive in socialism? For those of you who know me. So, <clears throat> JF, I don't know if he would characterize himself as alt-right, but his typical go-to, or at least years ago when I talked to him, is he's worried about the poor phenotype outbreeding the rich or smart phenotype. So his argument is usually like, <clears throat> socialism or redistribution of wealth is bad, because it'll mean poor, stupid people get to breed more and then their genes will take over, basically. The first thing is, are we acknowledging that humanity is a biological system? Are we acknowledging that the theory of evolution is true? Are we acknowledging that people are making more babies or less babies according to the characteristics that they have? This to me is a truth of life, but I don't know if my opponent denies it. To me, this is a simple fact of species on the earth. They evolve, they change, and they favor certain forms and they obtain certain directions uh, through evolutionary pressures. They become something. Now, once you realize this, you realize that any system ultimately will be an evolutionary system. Any political management plan for a society will be ultimately evolutionary. And although it's a more sensitive word, ultimately what it means is that everyone is participating to a form of eugenics, whether it's unintentional or intentional. Eugenics is happening. And so to someone who tells me, I'm not a eugenicist, I will show you a bad eugenicist. Ultimately, you are influencing what society becomes and how people evolve. You just don't want to acknowledge it or you don't want to recognize it, but ultimately you do. Now, the problem, once you realize that this is the state of humanity, that we will always be an evolutionary species, at least as long as we're engaged in baby making, is the fact that evolutionary systems converge, especially when you start giving to certain features, especially when you start rewarding certain features, and especially when you start when you start adopting a needs-based approach. If, if we were to go in a park and look at the squirrels <clears throat> and start feeding all of the squirrels according to their needs rather than their ability to gather nuts, we would find them ourselves in a million years from now or maybe in a hundred years from now with a bunch of fat squirrels incapable of caring for themselves, incapable of, uh, of gathering in nature the foods that they need. And there's a very simple approach to this. It's the, the sometimes you'll see little signs that will say, don't feed the birds or don't feed the squirrels. By not feeding the squirrels, we're trying to leave the evolutionary pressures go on to the birds or squirrel populations so that they don't become incapa incapacitated by too much caring, by too much giving. And one of the fundamental issues with socialism, it's not the only one, but it's so grave that it's not fixable in my view, is the fact that its eugenic function is poor. It is poor because of the needs oriented. <clears throat> JF is a very good debater. I, 
I feel like Lance is just going to try to laugh at everything and say like, well, this is absurd and not actually respond to anything. But we'll see what happens. Maybe he will impress us. That approach of socialism. Capitalism has its own way to exclude those who are unable to produce. If you don't make money in some way, if you don't produce something that some other people are willing to pay for, you would have less money and you would have less resources. And although it's not the case in our current society, because our current societies are not fully capitalistic, but in principle, in a fully capitalistic society, you would be essentially dying off from not having resources at all and having little babies. The problem is if you don't have that kind of eugenic function, if your policy is let's give to everyone according to how much they need, which socialism does in one way or another, whether it's through some kind of universal check, some kinds of um, food distribution to the people or service distribution to the people, you are creating an infinitely reproductive needs function. That is, people are draining your calories. They're making babies with it. They, they haven't proven that they were cap capable of gathering those calories. You have just given them through the hand of the government. And eventually you find yourself in the next generation with more poor people, more unable people who are more dependent on the government. And who knows how much time it takes before this system reaches the end. History actually seems to demonstrate to us that it only takes less than 100 years before these systems crash. But it could take more than a hundred years and perhaps a communistic or socialistic society can be stable for 200, 300, 500 years. But what we know is that at some point you're going to reach the problem that you are allowing the multiplication of needs while not incentivizing the addressing of needs. You're not incentivizing. You're not incentivizing it the way capitalism does. How does it do it? Capitalism incentivizes it by saying, if you find a way to address the needs of people, you're going to get money and you're going to be able to use that property in whatever way you want, including the ability to make babies. Communism and socialism do not do this. They incentivize inability. They incentivize people begging to the state without delivering to society. And therefore, socialism is bound to fail in some term, whether it's short or long. You got it. Thank you very much, J.F., for that opening statement. Lance, the floor is all yours. Middle guy. Uh, I just want to quickly say I will address all the points you brought up, but I just have a prepared statement. So I was going to use that for my first five minutes, if that's all right. Not As you wish. <laughs> all right. So when the last drop of monarchist blood had been spilt at the end of the French Revolution in 1799, the estates were converted into a national assembly, bringing an abolition to feudalism, state control of the Catholic <laughs> Oh my God, wait, what? Did you become a wolf talking box? Oh no. What's, where's the comic with the, with the little kid and the mom? And the mom was like, what's that? And then they see something and it's like, oh my God, look away. And then the kid looks at the mom and it's too late. And it's like, turn into, what, what's, there's like a meme format for that that I'm thinking of. For the first time, the ability to vote in a democracy. Promises were made of egalité, fraternité, and most importantly, liberté. Thus began not only the age of classical liberalism, but the age of capitalism. Capitalism has been the prevalent economic system for the past 400 years. Despite the promises of equality and liberty, Marx and Engels were able to observe how capitalism at its very core requires the exploitation of labor in order to be profitable. This isn't a matter of debate. In order to make money selling widgets, you first have to sell the widgets for more than you pay the workers who build them. This is what creates different classes in society between those who hire workers and the workers themselves. Themselves. We've had several dynamics like this in human history, master and slave, lord and serf, and then we have employer and employee. Not that the advent of capitalism got rid of the other dynamics. In fact, they formed hybrids. Capitalism didn't appear in its final form from the very beginning. There was other versions like mercantile capitalism, which is essentially a form of usury. Various forms would appear and die off like economic systems before them. Modern forms of capitalism include both the industrial revolution and the riches brought to it by the white race through the North Atlantic slave trade. I use the term white race because it was colonizers who invented the concept of race in order to justify the 
subjugation of African slaves that they brought over to the Americas to work both in cotton picking in the South and textiles in the North. Hundreds of years of slavery combined with capitalism amassed vast amounts of wealth for a certain subset of Americans. It then evolved again with the invention of corporations, which could insulate the owner from the legal liabilities of his company. Corporate institutions have grown to be the dominant economies of the planet, many surpassing the GDP of entire countries. As these corporations grow under capitalism, they also consume competing companies in the form of mergers and acquisitions, creating complete monopolies in certain fields. And while it may be tempting to insinuate that J.F. Gerepi is unable to read his copy of Mein Kampf because the pages are currently stuck together with his own cum, or that hatred of socialism and communism is because one of the most famous philosophers of those was Jewish, it should be pointed out that it's no surprise that a proud ethno-nationalist would endorse an economic system whose final form is fascism. After all, the dictatorial regimes of Franco, Mussolini, and Hitler all followed a set pattern, an authoritarian salvation of the capitalist system resulting in their oversight over its industries, a longing return to the mythical glory of their empires, a vilification of an entire people as a scapegoat, Catalonians or Jews, a distrust for the lying press, and finally the expansion of Leipzig or promised land in the form of settler colonialism. Corporations have no loyalty to their country of origin. Their loyalties are exclusive to producing profit for the shareholders. This can be seen in a company like IBM that is actually complicit in the Holocaust, developing the cataloging system necessary for the mass organization of the Jewish genocide. If one is to advocate for modern-day capitalism, they are also advocating for corporate dictatorships whose decision-making rests within a small handful of board members and CEOs. As I stated previously, these companies will devour one another until they have complete monopolistic control in their field. It's, this further, it's for this reason today that in America, nine banks control the majority of wealth and assets we depend on, eight food companies control all the products you see in the grocery store, five media companies control all the movies, television, and radio broadcasts we listen to, three technology companies control the vast majority of social media in the world, two companies produce the vast majority of beer in America. Under our capitalist system, six men own the collective wealth of seven billion people. The myth of a purely meritocratic system in which people advance solely on their talent wouldn't justify this disgusting inequality even if it was true, which it isn't. Capitalism is now resulting in the ecological disaster that threatens all life on Earth, yet the ability to stop CO2 output while pushing for an endless growth in a system with finite resources will eventually meet its catastrophic end. I'm sure it's inevitable that we will discuss the trillions of lives lost at the hands of the communists in China or Russia, but what I will be proposing here today is to look to other economic systems both from the past and present and analyze and adopt what is most beneficial to the vast majority of humanity. Any mature conversation about these topics should avoid playing team sports to previous ideologies and ascertaining which aspects are the most beneficial to everyone. In this, I state that no economy is completely giving workers over the control of their own production, and that a starting point for us to achieve that in our current system is through the implementation of worker cooperatives and worker unions. The Italian region of Emilia Romagna is where one third of the GDP is successfully produced through worker co-ops, and the fifth largest umbrella corporation in Spain, known as Montron, are two examples of such systems working efficiently. Now, I may just be a low IQ individual, but that doesn't take a lot of brain horoscopes to know the simple fact that our understanding of the universe evolves over time. Alchemy gave way to chemistry as astrology gave way to astronomy. So too can our economic system evolve to one that is more democratic, more efficient, less exploitative, and better for every member of the human race. You got it. Thank you very much, Lance, for that opening statement as well. We are going to jump into the open conversation, folks. I want to remind you, we have many juicy debates coming up. As you can see, for example, at the bottom right of your screen, we are thrilled as on June 9th, Apostate Prophet and Dr. Michael Brown will be debating whether or not there's a God. You don't want to miss it, so hit that subscribe button so you don't miss it. It's going to be epic. And with that, we're going to kick it into open dialogue mode. Gentlemen, thanks so much, and the floor is all yours. All right, so perhaps I can just return to my initial questions to the serfs uh, or Lance or the serfs. Is that how are you? Are you either, either works? Yeah, no, Lance is okay. good. Serfs is good. Doesn't matter. All right, so my initial question was so do we agree that humanity is a biological species with evolutionary forces with natural selection applying to it? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay, so do you understand the parallel between, say, population of squirrel that I would feed constantly, no matter how good they are at gathering nuts? And do you understand that ultimately I would drive this population to become unable to, to do the gathering that they should do to survive on their own? Uh, so this is the first time I've heard squirrel theory. I've, I've heard Jordan Peterson propose this with lobsters before. Uh, I would like to start to say that eugenics is a bad thing, and I don't think we should participate in it. Uh, and I haven't heard anyone use it as a way of... Wait, is it Jordan Peterson thing? Does the lobsters have to do with the evolutionary shit that JF is talking about? Defending capitalism yet? Also, I just, I don't know where this debate is going to go. Um, be very, 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 very careful saying, like, eugenics is bad. Um, 
I would probably, if I was debating somebody like JF, I don't think I would ever say eugenics is bad because you can get a lot of people on board. Most people are on board with like some form of eugenics um, because like the, the next question is like, um, like generally the next question will be like, oh, well, how do you feel about the idea that a lot of people think that you should have abortions for children that are gonna be born with severe mental disabilities? Most people will be like, yeah, that's okay, right? And just encouraging that or saying like, yeah, that's an okay thing. That's a form of eugenics, it really is. Um, now, how extreme or not extreme or whatever you wanna get with it, obviously there's gonna be a line there, but um, I, if you, if you just start off with eugenics bad, you're gonna get caught in a trap. And then even if you walk back a little bit and try to like stake out a position, it's gonna look like you're moving the goalpost. Um, yeah, you got to be really careful with that one, but we'll see where it goes. But uh, I will say this in relation to squirrels, almost all animals on the uh, planet, with the exception of humans, are engaged in something known as homeostasis, in which they will basically have an equilibrium with the world around them, and that includes squirrels. Uh, for example, if you put a whole bunch of rats in a cage and you give them a finite amount of food, they will stop reproducing as the food supply goes down. That's something that most people engage in. Humans are unique to this planet in the sense that we continue to excavate and exploit and uh, expand upon the planet, despite uh, it could result in the detriment of all our lives. Exactly. So don't you see the problem in giving in that most consuming species? And I, I, I agree with you that we are a species at very high disequilibrium with nature. But don't you think, therefore, it is the worst species that you could possibly feed for free? Yeah, that's oof. Depending on how, depending on how well versed JF is, ready to go into this too. There's a lot of like arguments that you could that Lance theoretically walks into here about like, okay, so we should be reducing the population. We are incredibly destructive as a species, especially, yeah, like. Ugh. Where does the free part come into this? Because you, you, well, like, have we moved? Have we moved past the squirrels? Are we on to squirrels to humans now? Yeah, we're talking about humans, and okay. I, I'm guessing that some aspect of your socialistic project must be to to address the needs of the people. Maybe you should define what is socialism in your view. Sure, absolutely. So socialism is the worker control over the means of production and distribution. And in my proposal that I've laid out here, it's not going to handle the second part, but it's going to meet the first part. And in that, I want to expand democracy the same way that you have democracy in your ability to vote for your elected leaders. I want the same democracy to be expanded into the place where you spend eight hours of your day every single day working in your job. So I think people in their jobs should have democratic control and say in their own positions. And so do you think that these uh, democratically controlled uh, production lines will be more efficient? Uh, they are more efficient, yeah. Most studies that have looked at the efficiency rates of worker cooperatives compared to traditional capitalist enterprises have shown that they are typically um, more efficient and uh, less wasteful than their counterparts. And I guess that you're going to tell me what most communists come here to tell me, that they're more efficient, but they're not successful because there's a conspiracy against you guys and the banking system. Uh, no, I wasn't going to throw that in there. But if we're doing the brackets, I mean, I'd, I'd probably pivot back to the fact that they're, they have the same rate statistically of decay as their capitalist counterparts. They don't have the same rate of birth. So that means that they do not start up as often as capitalist companies do. However, they fail at the same rate as capitalist companies. So if they were given the right or given the ability to start up on a regular basis, they would be just as efficient, uh, sorry, more efficient. Why don't they have the ability to start up, though? That's what basically JF was implying. Um, Lance is kind of agreeing. I don't know if than the capitalist counterparts, but they would die or decay at the same rate. Now, oh, he's not gonna what push proportion of the population do you think it's important to them to be in control of their working place, and what proportion just doesn't care about it? Well, I don't think most people are aware of the ideas I'm proposing, which is why I'm trying to tell them on bigger platforms. So I don't think if I polled the average American, they would tell you that what they're looking for in their job is uh, ownership over their own production. They would probably tell you they're looking for financial security for their friends and their family. Uh, and that's important to everybody. But in terms of what percentage should be, I am advocating for all, every, every single job to be worker controlled. Every against the will of the people. Let's say let's say there's a part of the economy that tells you we want to stay capitalistic. Our workers are perfectly fine with this. You would object to this continuing it to exist. 
I'm not forcing it upon anyone, though. I'm not, I'm not saying that this has to come down from the government on high or that there has to be some kind of Stalinistic regime that forces people to do things against their will. I'm saying that this is what I'm advocating for. Whether or not people choose to do this is something that I hope that I can spread by telling this message to more people. All right. Well, uh, I don't severely object against worker co-ops. I'm kind of enthusiastic about the fact that there are certain banks in Quebec that were worker co-ops. They turned out to be not so not so well managed and offering fees that became uninteresting with time. But I mean, in a capitalistic society, there is every ingredients needed for you guys to thrive as much as the as nature allows. And if you find your workers who are interested in building these projects, you should get them. And if you are right about the increased productivity, which I personally doubt, But as long as you're doing it without forcing it on people and with your own funds, I don't object to worker co-ops existing, really. So I think then the um, the burden of proof would be on you to defend the current paradigm that we have, which is that CEOs in America, on average, make about 325 times the rate of pay as their employees, and that we have a system now in which most workers don't have democratic control in their jobs. So we're talking about an environment where you spend eight hours of your day, and you have... That 325 number, I hear stuff like this thrown around so often. I wonder if this is only gotten by looking at like your S&P 500, like your Fortune 500 company, I should say your Fortune 500 company companies because I'm willing to bet well not willing to bet I know for a fact that like most small businesses the CEOs are not making 300 times their their line employed probably maybe 10 times maybe more it depends on the size of the business but like and, and the vast majority of businesses in America are small business so yeah I'm really curious where that how that number is pulled have no say as to what happens in your job that to me is a fundamental problem and that's one of the broken parts of our current system well to me it's not a fundamental problem and to me i think it shows a secret that a worker co-op or a socialistic system will never reach in terms of the mechanism of a capitalistic society and why ultimately it wins why it creates so much wealth that uh that it looks th that that even a poor worker in a capitalistic society ends up making more money than a, a rich one in a socialistic one. Uh, ultimately, it boils down to the <laughs> allocation need a citation of on that. Well, uh, just compare America in sure. compare a worker in America in the '60s to mm -hmm. a to someone in the USSR. Sure. You said a rich one, though. So you said that a worker in America is making more than a rich person in a quote unquote I'm not telling you, country. you won't find a single one in the USSR who's not richer than a McDonald worker. Of course, you will find this because communism is the accretion of power to central entities. And therefore, there are lots of fat for corruption open. But in general, the amount of wealth that was created by American society surpasses any sort of worries around the division of it. In, in other words, I I end up being richer today uh, because Facebook is so rich and because there are these central entities that are making even more. And yet my life is great today because these big entities exist. But anyways, get, go to, going back to what you asked can, can, me. Okay, so you asked me to define socialism. Can you define communism for me? Well, To me, communism is some kind of accomplished form of socialism. So I, I use the words interchangeably, but we're talking about control over the means of production. And JF is smart. He's not going to give you some dumb answer like communism is when the government redistributes. Wealth. Like I, he'll he'll under he'll have a really good understanding of all of these terms and definitions. I tend to I tend to try to use socialism for meaning a part of the the means of production have been taken over and communism meaning it's been taken over in full but then the in full the definition of the in full uh, is very relative for, for example as far as I'm concerned the means of production have been taken over so much in countries like Canada and the US that were essentially we've attained communism at this point Okay, that's really stupid. So I can stupid. define it for you. It's a moneyless, classless, stateless society. So we have not really had a true communist government in human history. No, and you won't, because uh, if you centralize power that much, you will have classes. Right, but I like. I think your umbrage might be with, um, say, Stalinism or, or something of that nature. 
Is this what you're trying to associate this with? Well, uh, no, not even that. I, I take issue with control. Encouraging people to have healthy children is not eugenics? Well, I mean, almost by definition it is, depending on how you define healthy, right? That's exactly what eugenics is, is the idea of creating, like, healthy progeny and selectively deciding who gets to breed or not breed in society or whatever is, is eugenics, right? Well, democratic control, state control, and worker control if it is done against the will of what is being controlled. So going back to what you mentioned about the inequalities of our societies, uh, mm -hmm. I don't take, mo it's not a problem for me and it doesn't change the path of my life. If I look at the progression between my gr great grandfather to me, it really doesn't change our lives that McDonnell is 100 times richer than us or 1 billion times richer than us. It really doesn't because, matter. Because you're not poor. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I've been as poor as someone can be. I mean, I've been in the streets. I've been without uh, locations to live. I've been without jobs and I've been with zero dollar in my account. So I, I don't, you can tell I'm not poor right now. And yes, I've been successful on YouTube, but I know what being poor is. And really it doesn't change my view of capitalism. What, even when I was poor, it, it's not a, a lack of empathy that I have with poor, or a lack of understanding with poor people here. It's a principled stance that I'm taking today. Sure. So in the case of Jeff Bezos, how much more does he make than the average worker in terms of like compensation? I don't know. And he makes, really about, nine, he makes about he makes about nine million dollars an hour. So that's over hundreds of thousands of times what his average worker makes. I <laughs> I don't I again I try to be careful. Because talking finance with lefties is so irritating, but like, it's so weird to think that like your hourly compensation, I, I guess like if you have ownership in a company, it kind of is, but it gets really messy to talk about stuff like that. Um, because like, that should probably never, ever, ever be taxed. The increase of an ownership in a business that you have is not something that you want to take from somebody until they've actually sold, until they've like realized a gain and had like a taxable event happen, like they've sold part of the share of a company. Um, let me explain this further. So here's like the issue that I have with this, because like, hold on, there's so many things I got to run through. People talk about total compensation, they include the appreciation that you have of any stock that you might own in a company, right? But the problem is that let's say that we think that's a bad thing. We talk about that's overall wealth compensation. We need to tax that, right? The problem with that is if, if I want to start taxing your increase in quote unquote wealth that you haven't even realized yet, and when I say realize, I'm talking about selling a particular stock that you might own, right? The problem is that you're basically telling people that as they gain wealth, you're going to like take their business from them. Like it's really weird. Like let's say for instance, let's say that I own a business. Let's say my business is worth $100,000 and I own 50% equity in it. We'll say I have a partner or whatever, right? So let's say my business is worth, what did I say? We'll say $100,000, I have 50,000 equity. Let's say I pay myself like a $30,000 salary to start. Really low, okay, so I work my way up, I work my way up. Let's say that I start growing the value of my business. I'm getting more employees. Let's say my business is worth $5 million, okay? And I'm up to giving myself like an $80,000 annual salary now and I've got some employees. Well, now my $5 million business, I have 2.5 million in equity in that business. If my equity grows and grows and grows and you wanna tax the equity that's increasing in my business, even though I haven't even sold it yet, do I have to start selling off chunks of my business now just to pay taxes? Like, I, I bet you're basically robbing anybody of the ability to own a business because you're gonna start like, fuck, like my business was worth, you know, a uh, hundred K, now it's worth five million. The government wants to tax me on the increase of value that I have now because of the ownership that I have of my business, even if I haven't sold part of my business yet. Like it, does, it doesn't, yeah, I don't know, like that, that type of tax scheme. But again, talking to socialists about finance is cancer because they don't understand anyway. But like, I, I don't know, there's no like sustainable or realistic. Then why do economists like wealth tax? The only things that I've seen for, I think economists were generally in support of Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax idea, but I think that started at 50 million plus. Wealth taxes in general are just a, it's a garbage tax. It is so hard to value somebody's estate. And then like, it's just, it's just very, very, very like work incentive. It would be better to just like increase the funding we have for the IRS to go after the people that are already violating tax stuff on the books that we don't have the resources to go after. Um, but I'm just saying that like, 
even if we did do a wealth tax, that's only going to be for very, 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 very high net worth individuals. That's not going to be for like people earning, you know, like a million or two million or whatever. Like that economist article you looked at categorically rejected a wealth tax. Maybe it's just, a wealth tax is very, very, very messy. Um, legitimate question: Does that mean you're against like capital gain stuff? Or our cap gains not okay? So a taxable event. If I buy a stock that's worth $100 and a year passes and that stock is worth $1,000, I shouldn't get taxed on that stock until I sell it. Once I sell it, then that means that I gain, um, then that means that the, the, the I sell it for $1,000, I have a $900 capital gain that I would pay taxes on. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with those taxable events. But don't tax me on the increase of my wealth when I haven't even really realized the gain yet. I haven't sold it yet. Yeah, Rage Pope, but they would probably make it more specific because technically what we could argue too is that like, let's say, because if you really wanted, well, no, there's ways you could legislate around this, but like imagine you're working a job and the markets have a really good year and your 401k appreciates a lot in value. Does that count now as part of your compensation since your overall wealth increased, right? Like, I don't know, that just, doesn't that mean that business owners would never sell their stock and never pay taxes on their company? Well, I mean, if you don't, if you never sell your business, sell your stock, then you wouldn't have to, but most people will sell their business or sell parts of their stock, right? Like, Do you think capital gains should remain lower than income? I, you know, I don't know. It's, it seems like capital gains, putting it at ordinary rates would raise more money. Would it discourage investment? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm like 50-50 on it. It might be fine to do it. Does it really, really keep people from investing? I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, I'm like mixed on it. I could go either way on that. Wouldn't you have to justify, because this is this is you proposing this, that he justifiably works hundreds of thousands of times more than his average worker no, in order to receive that compensation? The, because work time is not the unit of contributions to society. In, in other words, you can work all your life and produce less for society than Jeff Bezos could produce in a second. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't justify whether or not he gets paid that much more than his workers do, does it? Well, what do you mean by justify? Because it seems that embedded in your concept of justification is the assumption that work hours is the unit of contribution to society. Uh, no, I'm saying that if you work, you should be compensated for your work. I, I think that's something that we both agree on. At least I hope so. And Yes. And is there anyone working at Amazon who's not getting compensated for their work? But are they being compensated adequately for the work? I mean, in the case of Amazon, if you're showing up there and you're risking your life and you're getting COVID and then you're actually having to shit. And oh, my God. OK, listen, like, yeah, but it's like these people will come on and they'll be like, cops, by the way, that job, not dangerous at all. Lots of jobs more dangerous than being a cop. OK, you're a cop. Bullshit. That job's not dangerous. And then it's like Amazon workers, they go in and they risk their life. Like, come on, dude, let's. Dial, let's dial it back a little bit, all right? Piss and bags, I would say, and I would posit this, that maybe getting 15 to $17 an hour doesn't justify that kind of lifestyle and that maybe we should be paying them more. Maybe they should have more rights. Maybe they should be. How is sell your business to pay for a wealth tax different from sell your house to pay for property taxes? Um, I think that like the, the right to defend somebody owning a particular piece of property on in some area for their entire life is a lot different than the right for somebody to own their business for their entire life. I think that those are two different things. Like, I don't think I would care as much about the house. Like, people move. That's like part of like what happens is people moving places and doing shit or whatever. But um, like, infinitely, um, like being able to infinitely live in some area or, or being able to infinitely live in some areas. It's just I think it's just a stupid concept. I don't like that at all unionized they can fight up against the pissing and shitting in bottles and cans maybe they can i mean they, they can if they want really uh, as long as they're they're voluntary oh yeah there's also a substitution effect as well you can find another house uh, but like you can't just find another business that you own as well that's true voluntarily working for the salary they're given and they're accepting to piss in the bottle so be it uh, I, I i will not intervene in a third party relationship in which people are voluntarily submitting eight hours of their day to something else in exchange of money. But do you think it's voluntary? Because if you don't have a job in America, you probably don't have health care. And if you don't have health care, you might die. And if you don't have a job, you can't pay rent or eat. 
So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily voluntary. It's kind of like you're coerced out of survival. I would be really careful with using the, I'm sorry, fuck. I, I, hopefully GF starts saying more dumb shit and I can critique him, because I'm not just trying to like shit on Lance because Lance is an idiot. Um, the, the There's just like, there's so many like unfortunate like stereotypically bad arguments that he like walks into probably because he doesn't talk to anybody or ever has anybody challenge him on this. But like saying that because you work in a society where you need to like work to survive, you're being coerced into working. That's true of every type of society. And at that point, coercive has been so like misused and stretched, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Because the very easy flip around to this is, hey, in your socialist or communist society, would people have to work in order to be allotted food and shelter? Well, yes. Oh, so that society is coercive as well. So it doesn't really work as like an argument in favor of you, right? When coercive is just like, well, you have to work in order to survive, that's not, we're, we're being pretty flexible with what coercive means at that point. Well, uh, the state of default of humanity is to be faced with the natural elements. So I, I'm not going to start seeing the employers that offers a cover from the natural elements, that offers an option to these people. I'm not going to start seeing him as the evil person because the fact is, if Jeff Bezos wasn't there and if all of the capitalists were... In oh, the true. That same argument would also apply to taxes or theft. Yeah, basically. And if all of the companies weren't there, these people would just be in the forest, literally running for their lives. And so, no, I'm not going to see the employer relationship as an extortionist one, when in fact, in, in this relationship, all that Jeff Bezos gives is an option. But are they in the forest looking for nuts, for squirrels, or what, how does that work? Well, they'd be in the forest, potentially running away from uh, other tribes or running away from natural predators. Collecting nuts, I guess. Uh, you're trying to make a joke and it really doesn't connect. No, I'm not. I'm actually asking. I'm very confused by this. You're the first person who's ever yes, proposed humans this, this kind of nuts. idea. Uh, oh, I just realized what's happened here from the opening and everything. I don't think Lance did any actual research on JF. He just heard his audience say that JF is like a Nazi. So his whole opening statement was attacking JF for being an alt-right. Also, JF is like borderline a fucking Nazi, to be fair. Because I'm pretty sure, I think even in JF's own words, I try not to throw this word around loosely, believe it or not, but I think even in Jeff's own words, I think he advocates for a white ethno state. Or if he's not a Nazi, I think he's at least like openly like an alt writer. Like he wants like a white ethno state with superior genes and stuff. Um, although he might be a little bit different these days. Back when I talked to him a long time ago, that's what he literally advocated for. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe now he's got, he dresses it up in a different way or something, but. Um, the dwarf child runs off. Return to Captain Lo Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and this is, keep in mind, I'm somebody that says, I'm not sure Ben Shapiro is racist. So if I'm telling you somebody is like a Nazi or almost a Nazi, then 99% of people in society would, <laughs> would consider them a Nazi, okay? But uh, we'll say alt writer, okay? Uh, they do, they do. But I, I don't understand how the idea of survival in the animal kingdom is in any way related to economic systems for modern society that we're trying to propose here. Oh, fuck. So... The argument that Jeff has laid out is really clear. If Lance isn't connecting, then it means he either doesn't understand it or doesn't want to. Um, oof. Well, good luck on this one. This is going to get ugly, I think. Here it is. Here is how it's connected. Do you think that there are some human families that make more babies than others? Uh, of course there is. Do you think that therefore their genes are more present in the next generation as opposed to the other families that made less babies? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of other factors to contemplate there, but sure. If, if one person has one kid and one person has 10 kids, that person with 10 kids will have more genes in the gene pool. So if there are a bunch of genes that make you such that, one, you don't produce anything for society, but two, you can beg as well as others, and in fact, better than others for governmental support. Do you think that this might cause a problem on the evolutionary time scales if the government was to start feeding these families with everything they need to survive and make further babies, further higher numerous babies? 
Right. But then you're, the solution to your problem would just be to have as many kids as possible. Like, wouldn't it just be if you just fuck a ton and have 30 kids, you're going to win at my strange scenario? Well, uh, that would be the solution from the perspective of a human wanting to undermine this system. But this human in a capitalistic society would find himself with the limits of his own resource. He would find himself punished by the system if he cannot find something to produce, something to sell, something to trade. The problem is if you start rewarding people arbitrarily for just having needs, you end up rewarding the having of needs and you end up rewarding everyone who can just beg more money or equal amounts of money while not producing for the rest of society a good output. It sounds to me like you really have a problem with welfare, but you don't want to say it outright. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. It's not. Oh, no. I mean, I, I'm totally fine saying it outright. I take issue with welfare. Do, do you support things like UBI and welfare? I absolutely support UBI, but I support real UBI in that I think that we should be taxing those who make the most in society and using those taxes to be able to pay for those who can't work. It's one thing that's really, really, really funny is a lot of left-leaning people are so like careful about like supporting UBI, even though they all do, is because they're so scared of like, oh, when I talk about UBI, I don't want to get rid of all the welfare and then bring in UBI or whatever. Because I guess at some point it became a popular idea that UBI was like a secret plan to like get rid of welfare. I, I, I noticed that happened. I don't know if somebody actually advocated for it, but like... Like um, that, I I just think it's really funny when you bring up UBI against lefties. They kind of cringe a little bit. Like, don't get rid of the the rest of the welfare. And and honestly, everyone uh, to a certain extent. That was part of Yang's platform. Yeah, but the idea was supposed to be, the idea was supposed to be that if you get rid of all of the other programs and you only do UBI, the overall compensation of poorest people would increase. But people on the left were saying that like, well, the overall compensation is going to decrease if you do that. That was the problem. Which is kind of funny because it's an argument for targeted like welfare more, which is it kind of gets into like mean testing arguments, don't you? Now, do you realize, given that you seem to accept the theory of evolution and you seem to accept all of the bases that that if you feed a family that makes more babies, they, you will have more of them in the next generation and more of their genes. Do you see the unsustainability of this system over evolutionary times? So the problem comes in in that more people are going to receive more food and make more kids. Is that it? Exactly. And that ultimately you will find yourself with an infinitely growing population until you cannot sustain their needs. You cannot you cannot produce enough to sustain the needs that you've created. Okay, so if I'm going to snap us back to reality, um, in our current system, we overproduce food as a humanity. Oh, God, he's not. <laughs> I don't think Lance can address this. Art. Oh, it's so sad because, like, I told you before we started this what JS position was because he's been, he's had the same position for years, literally years. Then he gave me this argument when I was like, talking to him in the first time like three or four years ago, I don't think Lance like prepared for this line of argumentation at all. He's gonna be totally fucked. So all he can do is kind of like grandstand or virtue signal like, well, I do support poor people and I do support UBI and I do support like people's right to blah, blah, blah. Like he's not, he doesn't actually have like a, like a response to this. Like as a species, we currently produce twice as much food as we consume. We, we throw out twice as much food. Uh, sorry, we throw out, like we produce twice the amount of food that we would normally be able to consume. So the problem isn't food production in any way. It happens to be distribution. And that What is the response to a genetics from an argument as welfare that the epigenetic impact of increasing the welfare of children will have an evil amount of obvious pressure? Um, I don't know. I would have to, th honestly, I would have to think about this for a while. Um, I, I, I think that there's a couple things that I'd look at. One is I don't think that humans are, I don't think that humans exist on a spectrum of like, if we go with the nut gathering analogy, where it's like, uh, like can get food or can get, can get no food, right? Um, and then we ought to value, and you could replace food with survival or whatever, right? I think that humans are probably capable of contributing in other ways that, that don't like help their survivability, but are still desirable to society. So, Here's an example. Like, it might be the case that people are able to provide um, uh, some form of archival, like historian perspective, or some people are capable of writing entertainment or art, or some people are capable of doing things like this. And then these are things that wouldn't go towards their survival necessarily, but they would be things that would help um, that, that other people would find desirable.
Uh, so like, I wouldn't just look at this as, as like, and, and like those genes could reproduce even though they can't collect food. But I wouldn't look at this as like desirable or not desirable. L like this just one spectrum I think is like a little bit too simplistic. Can't you also just advocate for a system where you have welfare, but also have well-funded programs to try and help people get back on their feet and get a job or get education? Maybe, yeah. I also, I also don't think that people make the decisions to have babies in response to getting welfare. I don't think that's a decision that most people make. It seems that as we've moved to more industrialized ages, like people just tend to have less children. I would expect that trend to continue. I don't think that there's like the, the I think that JF is positing a phenotype that doesn't exist. And this phenotype is like an infinitely like resource greedy welfare uh, consuming individual that's just trying to have more and more and more and more and more babies. I don't think that that quote unquote phenotype exists rationally in society. I don't think so. This is usually the case with a lot of things under capitalist systems. So it doesn't go down to a matter of like how many babies are going to be able to be born at a given time if they're receiving a certain amount of food. It all comes down to the fact that we have certain systems in place that benefit certain people. Well, you say you snap back to reality, but really you slap back to an alternate reality. Uh, first, the surplus of food you mentioned, that doesn't matter. Uh, if you have created an infinite need function, you're going to reach a point at which you have people consuming all of this food. I don't think you've addressed the problem intergenerationally. How do we lead to a sustainable system in which yet we are creating infinite needs? Yeah, but I mean, you keep going back to this. It sounds really eugenics-y, right? Like, I'd ultimately, if I really boiled this that's down... Not, that's not really an argument. I, I feel like Lance is just trying to... I don't think he knows who he's debating. You can't just like, oh, that's eugenics, and then Jeff's going like, oh, no, it's not eugenics. Like, Jeff will, own, Jeff will own that. Jeff will say, like, okay, yeah, sure, it's eugenics-y, sure. Now what? Like, he's going to make him... He's going to make... You have to argue more than just saying, like, oh, it's eugenics, so it's bad. You have to argue more than that. It kind of sounds like poor people have too many babies. Is, is, is that... Is that a disingenuous? That's exactly what he's saying. But the problem is that like, JF isn't like trying to, it's funny because Lance is like playing like the optics where like, are you trying to say that poor people shouldn't have as many babies? And JF will be like, eh, yes, that is what I'm saying. Like, he'll just be like, yeah, <laughs> like. It's one way to phrase it. The thing is, as a capitalist, I don't even take issue with poor people having babies. As long as they have the ways to self-sustain their families and to, uh, to deliver services to them. The problem is when you start taking from others to feed these families, then you are entering a relationship of theft. And that's a problem evolutionarily. And I don't hear a solution. You, you seem to be, your solution is, well, that's eugenics and therefore I don't have to address it. The thing is, we've discussed the logical basis of what you call eugenics. You accept all of the series of facts and rational processes behind my conclusions. But you end by saying, well, I'll call it eugenics and therefore I don't have to address it. I would yeah. like you to address Okay, it. sure. If, if you would like me to address this, uh, yeah, the the solution to uh, like large population growth happens to be both historically and from a scientific standpoint, uh, the education and empowerment of women. So if you take any country that is uh, you know, developing and happens to have uh, a large population growth through the education and empowerment of women of their population, you will see uh, a lowering of uh, exceptional birth rates. So that's, that's a solution that already has, or sorry, that's a problem that already has a solution. I think this is true. I think it has a local solution in a bubble of time. <clears throat> and I, I will say you're totally right. When you what what you call education and empowerment, I, I tend to see it more as anti-reproductive propaganda. But okay, let's take your word, <laughs> education and and empowerment. It's true that if you pass a perfectly fertile woman through the university system and you keep her eyes open in front of the professors and you get her through ten years of her most fertile life uh, into learning quantum physics, it's true that she's going to produce less babies. Uh, that being said, I don't think it's a sustainable system because what you have as a reaction to this is simply people evolve away from going at the university. People evolve low IQ to avoid the university. And I think that what we're seeing in our society is we've attained this peak. We we have reached a peak of IQ, and now the high IQ people are really doing too, uh, making too little babies 
So what we're going to see in the next few generations is probably a decrease of IQ, a higher reproductivity of the lower IQ scales. And that's okay, you know. Uh, but it, it means that the system here is not sustainable. It's like you're, you're not going to force people to go to university, or if you do, then you'll be committing an immoral act in my view. I, I just, my, my problem, and I don't even know how you'd begin to like dig into this argument, is that like the phenotypes that, that JF talks about just seem so incredibly simplistic. Um, like the idea that like you, you can just select for intelligence like this and just breed it out of a society. Um, but I, I feel like in order to make arguments about this, you would have to get like, I don't even know where you would start. You have to get like really, really, really empirical. Um, is what JF is saying now correct? Can this really happen in a few generations? I thought it took uh, 10, well, because, because intelligence is such a highly polygenetic trait, meaning that intelligence is regulated by, I think they've identified over like 200 genes or whatever. Um, that like it's it, it would it would take it would take an unbelievable amount of selective pressure over probably thousands of generations um, in order to actually start to see the effects of this, and that's assuming that IQ is something that is entirely controlled for by um, just genetics and isn't um, like environmentally affected whatsoever, anything like that. Uh, I, I, I like it just it feels like this is a very 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 simplistic view, like. If JF was giving a, a, a conversation about like amoebas hunting for food in a petri dish, I think that what he's saying would would apply one hundred percent. I I think that everything he's saying would be true. But I think that human society is way too nuanced and intricate, and I think that there isn't like the selective pressure that is as extreme as he's talking about. I just I don't think that you're gonna get this type of like selective pressure that's going to breed out all human intelligence in like even a hundred generations. It's gonna take so, so, so much time to do this. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm not, I don't buy that. Uh, I kind of like don't wanna get too bogged down on IQ. Uh, I didn't think we'd be talking about that in a debate uh, between capitalism and socialism, uh, to be totally frank. And I, I kind of think of it as incel, uh, sorry, astrology for incels. So maybe um, if you think that it's like a temporary solution to a problem, but it's one that bears out and you just admitted that it bears out every single time that it's implemented, why not continue to do the thing that works? Isn't that just the natural progression of this? I mean, the thing is something can work and it, it won't work over evolutionary times. There are there are temporary solutions over evolutionary times that can work, but evolution by its nature is already fighting against it. And I think it's already what we're seeing. Uh, I think that you have high fertility in low IQ females right now. They are the re reproductive elite. And this is going to have impacts down the line. It's going to change our society. We're going to have a lot of stupid people, and that's okay. I actually have respect for for low IQ people. But yeah, it, it doesn't solve the problem on the evolutionary scale. And I'm left thinking, well, capitalism has all of these solutions built in. And capitalism never even wanted to fix these problems. It's just that in the simple systems of consent, voluntarism, and the accumulation of property, somehow the ingredients were there to make a human society that was arimated enough to nature that it wouldn't fight against it. The problem with the projects you're proposing is that they are really all fights against nature. And we can get uh, more in detail on the worker co-op, for example, but that's another fight against nature. The fact is that <clears throat> the brains of people, of workers, have not demonstrated their fitness at managing the world, at managing their own companies. So why would I put them in control of the whole companies? To me, it looks like giving to a, a very important decision to a bunch of people who haven't demonstrated their ability to make particularly good decisions. So that's sure. why I can, I can address. I can address that one. All yeah. right. Uh, first off, I think your entire plan, you're basically just describing the movie Idiocracy. And then secondly, to workers working in, you know, the means of their own production, uh, you know, having supervisors and stuff like that, those exist within every single one of the working cooperatives and the big examples I was trying to give you. Those have hierarchies, but they are justified hierarchies in that if you are the CEO of the company, you will only make between five to eight times what your workers do, but you will justifiably have to do about five to eight times the work that they do. Well, at the same time, at the end of the year. How, wait, why, what does he? 
think in a co-op, a supervisor does eight times as much work? Okay, hold on real quick. I, and I don't know if this comes from like labor theory of value, understanding or, or where these guys get this thing or whatever. Like you're compensated in society based on the the demand for your particular type of work. You're not, you don't, you don't, your salary doesn't come from you working X times harder or X times as much as somebody else. It comes from how many people are capable of doing the work you're capable of doing, and then how many people are demanding the type of work that you're capable of doing. That's, that's where your, that's where your pay comes from. That's it. So like, if there's only one person in the world that can do a particular thing, that guy's going to be paid a fuck ton for it. But then you don't go and say like, oh, well, is he working, you know, a fuck ton harder than everybody else. Well, no, but it's not, you don't get paid based on how hard you work. That's not how it works. That's not how anything is valued in today's society. Um, it's, ugh. Every year they get to vote on their board of CEOs in that if you are a shitty CEO or you're a CEO who's just basically embezzling money for your own uh, enrichment, then you will be removed effectively, which would be a much better system, a much more democratic system for every single person who's working for these companies instead of the dictatorships that we have now, which is basically every major corporation in the U.S., well, I agree with some of what you say. First, uh, the CEOs are doing embezzlement. Yes, there are dirty players in capitalism and there are forces that are to be criticized and they, they, they make our world less productive. I'm, not, I'm just not sure that even a worker co-op can stop this kind of system of corruption. I'm just not sure that the people has any insight that would allow to fix these problems. Ultimately, the, the worker is just one component in the whole ecosystem of a company. Why don't, why don't you have customers co-op or providers co-op? Why is a company being defined by the people who are giving work hours to it only, when in fact the company is a system of ins and outs, of demands and requests and offers? Uh, that is. Well, I, I mean, why not offer it to Yelp reviewers too? At the end of the day, you should offer it to every single person who's exactly. involved in the company in some respect. Uh, yeah, well, that's asinine nonsense. You would, you have to have it with the people who work in the company itself. That's what workers owning the means of production do. They're the ones who actually produce the products. Otherwise, there's no point in involving outside. You can take outside influence. You should take feedback as a company, but ultimately, you're the one making the products that people buy. Yeah, but well, all I'm pointing is that the unit of making the product is, is a very arbitrary unit. Uh, ultimately, there's work that's been going on into the parts that were bought by the company. So why don't we give control of the workers that produce, say, the car wheel drive? Why don't they control the company that makes the car? Well, it seems like it's pretty arbitrarily divided on, well, these guys are spending eight hours in this building or that building. Capitalism has resolved this by offer and demand and price at the moment of trade on a voluntary basis. So you, you really can do anything. But once you buy the wheel drive, you can make a car with it. And you don't need to know anything else than this is the price of a wheel drive. And if you're not happy with that price, you can go to another company and get it from them. Why would we give control and decision-making power to units that have really shown nothing else than just an interest into renting their body for eight hours to a given entity. To me, it strikes me as unnatural and potentially leading to failure. That being said, as, as I said at the beginning, I'm all for worker co-ops to be given their chance. I just don't think it's going to be a particularly good way to manage a company. So they've already been given their chance. There's already like a wide body of data that we can use to see whether or not they've been uh, efficient uh, within the marketplace. Now, again, I, I don't know how many times I need to reiterate this. They are not directly going to be in charge of all decision making. You will have to have people who are superiors, people who are going to manage teams. The difference being is that those people can be voted out uh, if they're not performing adequately. That's basically it. And at the end of the day, why would a worker want to have any uh, involvement in a company, even though he's just kind of like a flesh meat sack there for exploitation? Uh, because I think fundamentally every single person should have skin in the game. It'll make them better employees. I mean, the, the results speak for themselves. Every single time people who are involved in worker cooperatives are pulled on this, they report better job satisfaction, better involvement. Uh, they're more encouraged to work in their job because they're actually being involved in the products they're making. I've seen these uh, studies 
I find them extremely focused on single domains and extremely limited. Uh, I think that if you were to build an entire society where like 50% of the whole economy is in worker co-ops, I think you'd start seeing problems that you wouldn't detect in these studies. Uh, that being said, you know, again, worker co -op. So something that JF brings up here is probably maybe a little true because so few co-ops exist you're probably running into a fairly extreme selection bias when you run into the people that do work in co-ops. It wouldn't surprise me. If somebody told me like on its face right now, if somebody was like, did you know that co-ops are more productive and the employees are more productive than the average worker? I'd probably immediately agree. I'd be like, yeah, that, that probably makes sense. But it's probably because there are, or, or I shouldn't say it's only because. It might still be the case that if everything was co-ops, it would still be better. But because it's so limited right now, it might be the case that the only people that can afford to join co-ops or the only people that even know that co-ops exist or would work in co-ops are more likely to be more productive or efficient employees anyway, because it's still like a pretty restricted or not very well known about like form of organizing a company. Co-ops should be let to exist. They can exist without problems in the capitalistic system. So, so uh, in the case of the Italian region I was telling you about, one third of all the businesses in that region are worker cooperatives. So we have an overwhelmingly large data set to be able to like pull information from. And it's it's been showing itself time and time again to be more efficient than its counterparts and as well produce higher job satisfaction for the workers. All right. Well, uh, if people are happy in Italy doing that, they should keep going. Now, uh, the efficiency of democratic system. Uh, do you realize that you're pushing for a system in the workplace that is absolutely unsatisfactory in terms of how it manages our politics, for example, because we have democratic politics. Do. Uh, do you realize that are you satisfied with the way our politics is turning out? No, but that doesn't have anything to do with the fundamental principle that I think every person should have a vote in democracy. Like just because I don't enjoy if Donald Trump gets elected doesn't make me think immediately that I should just abolish democracy like that. I mean, I don't think that there's any reason why we should skirt into something like authoritarianism or fascism just because we don't like the results of the election. Well, I, I certainly don't do not advocate for authoritarianism, but what I note is that the transfer of authority that happens when you create a democracy is to take what you found was immoral if done by a dictator or a single individual and to suddenly find it moral when it is imposed by the mob. There is a fundamental problem. Do you know about these studies Lance is talking about and do they prove anything? Um, I would have to go back and look again, but my understanding is that broadly speaking, I don't think many people contest. I've only seen like articles or anything, but I haven't read the actual studies. My understanding is that it's broadly understood that um, co-ops are more efficient than um, comparable um, like privately managed firms. So that's not like a controversial thing. I think that's true. Uh, but then the arguments will come down to why are they more efficient? That's that's where the big arguments come in from, right? And that all of the authoritarian things that you seem to criticize within the current structure of hierarchy in a capitalistic company, you just want to delegate this authority to the group. Why is it better when the authority, the same authority with potentially the same oppression onto the individual is suddenly transferred to a wider group. Well, you're, if you're using the parallels of politics, that's the same problem, right? Like, why is it better if someone, say, a fascist, has complete authoritarian control over his people, which is the current paradigm we have with corporations. With corporations, we have small amounts of boards and CEOs. Their only responsibility is the fiduciary responsibility they have to their shareholders. All the decision-making is made by them, and it can affect millions and millions of people sometimes. So that is a fundamental problem. I think we should expand democracy into those companies so that everyone has a say in what involves their lives. But for example, don't you take issue with the fact that people have voted across the years drug laws and that ultimately it is the people who is oppressing drug smokers and putting them in jail? So if you want to talk about the history of drug uh, prohibition, a lot of it is centered around racism in the United States, particularly to vilify uh, black and Hispanic people. And one of the problems with that is it was propagated through the US system and then spread worldwide. Uh, its racist origins do not in any way think to me that it makes it uh, okay that that was permitted for so many years. There was a huge amount of money spent on fear mongering and scapegoating individuals so that everyone in society ended up thinking that drugs were bad. 
That's where that all comes from. And this goes back to a big problem we have with the capitalist system. Under a capitalist system, if you have capital, you have power. So the more capital you have, the more power you have to basically change society as a whole. So that is a fundamental problem to me because you have individuals who will have a lot of accrued capital, a lot of accrued power. They will be able to influence politics. That's the bigger problem I find with liberal democracy in any way, shape or form than I take with the very fundamental idea that everyone should have a democratic vote. Well, I think that you're making my point here because you're you're talking about people and you're demonstrating a case in which they were they were driven into a bad vote, a, a vote that I guess you disagree with. Do you disagree with the drug laws as they've been enacted oh, and applied I, in the absolutely. U.S.? Oh yes, no, of course, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that uh, drugs should be legalized, um, but that doesn't so, change the fact that again, under the system, it is those with capital who will be able to exude power over politics, who will be able to influence politics, either through lobbying or other coercive methods. There's a huge entrenchment uh, with the both the prison industrial complex that required a large amount of people to be uh, fulfilling those empty seats when it comes to prisoners. Like this this whole thing is like, you're, you're opening up a huge uh, can of worms in terms of like a, a different topic, but that doesn't change the fundamental principle again, that I believe that everyone should have a democratic vote. Like, do, do you not think that, do you not think that democracy should exist? I think that democracy is an aberration and a violation of individual rights. I, <clears throat> I, I recognize that there are some things in society, like the gathering of trash that may need some kind of collective system. And perhaps democracy is this imperfect system that could allow us to determine the schedule of trash collection. But ultimately, I think that democracy is an authoritarian regime putting the authoritarianism into the hands of the mob. And so I reject democracy as a whole. So what is your alternative? So you are the one well, who's ultimately advocating for authoritarianism, not me, ironically. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm advocating against authority. I, I do not think that a group of X million people should have authority over whether I smoke drugs or not. Yeah. So how do you manage politics then? Do you just want to abolish the state? Are, are you going for yes, like Yes, I'm basically a minarchist. So I, I think of the state as a kind of small operation that should remain less than 1% of the economy that should just handle whatever really can't be handled by the rest. But I'm for the abolishment of most of the state. And uh, as far as the control of whatever is left, uh, there could be democratic components to it. But what I ultimately believe in is a super strong <coughs> constitutional order that essentially keeps this democracy from growing into the kind of authoritarian nightmare that it has grown into right now. So I am assuming you're essentially an anarcho-capitalist, which means you're a cartoon character. And ultimately what that means is that you would have to justify unjust hierarchies, right? That would be the idea of what an anarchist is. Any unjust hierarchy, the burden of proof is lying upon them to justify that hierarchy. God, Lance is coming in with all the dialogue trees. That's that's exactly what the definition means. In your society, then, I assume the rich, the, the incredibly wealthy, would just be the ones who had access to everything they needed, like hospitals, schools, education, and those who are unable to accrue wealth or survive in that society would just have to die by the wayside. Uh, I don't take issue with people dying if if it must happen. And in fact, everyone dies. Uh, that being said, you say that I justify unjust hierarchy. No, to the contrary. Uh, there is an unjust hierarchy right now, as you've said it yourself, in the fact that a mob of people can have decided that for the last hundred years, we were arresting the, the people who just decided to smoke drugs for themselves. I believe that this is an unjust hierarchy and I'm defending the opposite, an absence of hierarchy or a presence of hierarchy in those cases where it is consented to by the individuals. So in your ideal scenario then, in, in this like ANCAP wonderland, what exactly takes place? Like how do people... Um, govern themselves like how, how does someone have access to a hospital how does someone have access to a road if the government itself is not even building the roads well uh we can talk about the roads and i, I think that the roads would be 
like they were before the governments took them over, which is that most roads have been built by the people who live on them and are then sold to the government. Most roads are actually private entities that have been handed to the government just for the maintenance function. As far as hospitals, they would follow the law of demand and offer. So if you're a doctor, you're selling a service. If there's not enough people buying your services, then your hospital is not worth existing. It will disappear eventually because it doesn't make enough profits. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you could have in these societies superb systems of health insurance, but you may not also. It all depends on what people need and what people are willing to pay. And ultimately, the free market will be what determines what exists. I don't know where you read that. Like, I've never heard someone say that all roads were built privately and then bought to the government. But on average, roads are usually paid for by the government itself through taxpayer dollars and then established and built. And yes, the roads would then turn over to, I guess, people in the ANCAP paradise. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, let's just say, development of new roads would ever take place without some kind of social funding. Like, you have to understand on some level, unless you happen to be wealthy, or, I mean, outside of that, in your ideal scenario, everyone would be left by the wayside. Like the, the poorest individuals in society wouldn't have access to healthcare. They wouldn't have access to education. They wouldn't even have access to toilets. Access to toilets? Uh, I think that, that toilets are, I mean, people are buying their own toilets today. They are building their house and they're putting a toilet in it. Uh, yeah, if they're not homeless, because if they're homeless, they're not building a house at all. Well, yeah, if they're homeless, uh, the, the opposite of this is to say that someone who's homeless is entitled to have a house builder work for them. And so who's the authoritarian here? Well, it is Lenz right here, because he's telling us that you are empowered to compel the house builder and the doctor and the hospital to serve this homeless person who has nothing to offer to them. So the, the reason I care about sustainable system is that ultimately Lenz system is unsustainable, authoritarian, and consists in ultimately the forced labor of a bunch of people who shouldn't be forced to work. Or if he, if he has them not through forced labor, if he doesn't force the doctor to cure them and force the house builder to build a house for them, he will be essentially forcing them through printed money or death or government intervention, which will be another kind of force and another kind of theft. Yeah. So in terms of building houses for the homeless, um, it's it's statistically been proven. You don't have to do it from a moral standpoint, but it actually saves your society money at the end of the day. It costs an overwhelming amount of money to police and to hospitalize people who are homeless, whether they have a drug addiction or they're... That's not an argument, though, because JF would say just let them die, unironically are, uh, you know, uh, perceptible to crime or things like that. So ultimately, yes, building houses would be something that would reduce the amount of crime and reduce the amount of burden on uh, your hospitalization system. On top of which, we currently live in a current paradigm right now, the capitalist one, the one that, you know, exists in which there are a very small amount of people. In this case, it happens to be six individuals who have the collective wealth of 7 billion humans. So we have a gross disproportionate disparity of income redistribu uh, redistribution. And a big problem with that is that they are not being used to put that money towards anything of good. Like I know a lot of the money is obviously going to be in shareholder value. I'm not trying to say that it isn't. But if we have such a huge concentration of wealth into the hands of the very few at the expense of everybody else, there should be more equitable systems. That's what I'm advocating for. Like systems that work better for every single human. It, it, you don't even have to do it from a humane perspective. It just works from like better from a societal uh, perspective. Well, uh, I don't think there should be a more equitable wealth distribution and moments of the past where we have seek this more equitable wealth distribution have led to societies that have just not produced as much beauty and as much wealth and as much productivity for everyone as those who were more capitalistic. That being said, on the question of uh, the homeless and saving the homeless can benefit society, the, we never really get the final count on this. Because if we got the final count, uh, you could just start a business. Uh, in you, you would start a business in saving homeless and you, you would cash in on it. 
we never really quite get this. We get well, what's the, what's the profit motive? Us. What's the profit well, motive for that business? You would essentially get them out of homeless status, and you would have yeah, a deal the, with the, them. The that burden, they, they the burden that the homeless people provide is to society itself. It's going to be in the amount of money that you, as society, have to spend on hospitals, on policing, stuff like that. So there's no profit incentive for a private company to come in and solve that. Well, then we enter another domain, which is uh, if if the homeless are costing things to society because they're committing crimes, and you you say that it's it's bec it becomes an economic gain because you will keep them from committing a crime, then you're essentially getting extorted by a bunch of criminals, and we cannot, as a society, have organizing principle that say we're going to pay you not to become a criminal because it, it's. You're beginning the extortion here. It's like, how many people, how much are you going to pay for just keeping them off the streets, as we say? And there's no end to it. Again, it's an unsustainable system. What do you think causes crime? Causes crime? Uh, I mean, what causes people to eat and consume pornography and do ABC? It's just, it's the human brain. The human brain yeah, so, causes so, crimes. So the answer is poverty. Poverty is typically the most common precursor <laughs> to crime. And it makes sense. If you don't have money to feed yourself or you happen to be addicted to drugs, you're probably going to turn to crime to be able to feed yourself or get yourself those drugs. So it has nothing to do with some kind of innate probability. There's, there's no gene for poverty that exists within the human genome. You don't know that. Okay. Is that, is that what you're proposing? You've discovered the poverty gene? Is that where we're at? No, because genes don't work that way. It's not a poverty gene or a homosexuality gene. He's going to argue that it's a, there's a poverty phenotype. It might be one or more genes that control for it. But if you selectively breed for them and you have the selective pressures that Lance is advocating for, then you will increase the appearance of that poor phenotype through society, is, I think. The problem is that the human genome is a complex entity and some, some of it makes you more likely to be intelligent, less likely to be intelligent. And down the line in the causal influence of thousands of genes, uh, you may have paths that lead to more likely criminality or less likely to be criminal and or less likely to be poor or more likely to be poor. Uh, there's is, definitely is polygenic studies that show genetic correlation with wealth, genetic correlation with IQ and educational attainment. So there's the answer to your question is almost yes. It's just not one gene. It's a thousand genes. Isn't this your field of study? Yes, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Yeah. So why is your understanding of this so cartoonish? Like, I, I, I don't... I can't wrap my head around the idea that you think poor people were genetically predisposed to being poor. Well, I will let people judge who's more cartoonish be between the guy who has no training in biology and asks for the poverty gene and the other guy who does have training in biology and who informs you that we have correlations between genes and poverty. And I uh, you got, man, you have to be so much more careful here because like the stuff the, and this is why i actually i do not debate people like this because the level of like prep that you need to get through a debate like this is insane but a lot of what jf is saying is true but like the parts that you would argue with him on are, would be very challenging to do without either a significant amount of prep work beforehand or having like that prerequisite area of study so like when jf says that some genes are more correlated with being poor and other genes are more correlated with being wealthy that wouldn't be surprising. Even if he said that some genes were causally related to being poor or causally related to being wealthy, that wouldn't necessarily be surprising either. I'm sure that these causal factors probably exist. But the question is, how many generations would you need to quote unquote destroy the gene pool? How does the genetic variance in society work? Do people really only selectively breed within classes such that they are exerting enough selective pressure to breed out the high IQ genes and to increase the prevalence of low IQ genes? Like the areas that you have to fight with them on here 
are very, very complicated areas. However, he doesn't have the answers to these questions. Either. I know he fucking doesn't, right? Because this is all like hotly contested stuff. Um, even in the genetics community, when you talk about like intelligence and IQ, and that's why they write these big letters back and forth publicly to they support this, they don't support that. Uh, JF is, is on, he's pretending he's standing on much more solid ground than, than he actually is. But like the amount that you have to go back and forth arguing this is, is very, 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 very complicated. Um, and I think that when you just try to hand wave and go like, oh, well, you don't know anything about this stuff. You're like, no, he does. He clearly does. Whether you like him or not, he does have a PhD in neuro, I think it's neurobiology or it might just be neuroscience. Um, like the basic stuff that he's talking about is true. So if you want to fight him on this, you have to go a step further. Um, but yeah. IQ and educational attainments in the thousand counts. Well, yeah, I mean, they'll have to judge between a clown on the internet who makes jokes for a living and someone whose actual academic field of study is in this very fucking specialization. <laughs> I mean, do you have an argument? Because I, I don't, okay. I can pull the studies. We can get into the nature papers that look into the meta study of all twin studies. And the thing is, do you have an argument or do, do we have nothing here? Uh, yeah, I, I do have an argument. According to the uh, International Monetary Fund, as well as numerous studies on what is the causal link between poverty uh, and crime, it's almost always established that crime is a precursor. Uh, sorry, poverty is a precursor to crime. Like that, that that has been established time and time again. I, I, I've yet to see anyone propose the fact that there is a genetic link for people becoming poor outside of maybe what? like uh, the bell curve. Well, <laughs> uh, you can get into nature papers and you type genetic correlation between uh, GWA studies and twin studies, and you'll find you'll find genome-wide association analysis. Of the g getting into critiquing the GWA stuff is also very, 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 very complicated. Um, oof, I wouldn't do this. I would never do this on a call with JF. This is stuff that because. Because even how you select for the groupings that you do in the GWAS shit is like highly controversial. Whoa, fuck all that shit. F this. Risk tolerance and risky behavior. That's one that's more specialized. I would have to find the one that gives all the answers that you want. But there's definitely genetic correlation between the genes on the one hand, the twin studies establishing the polygenic influence of genes and all of the factors we've talked about. Now, have you ever realized that I you I don't know why oh god and this still goes on for an hour fuck he Lance didn't do any prep for this at all why would you try to challenge him on these grounds you either could stick to philosophy where you don't need quite the level of depth to get into it or if you really want to go down the biology or genetics route you have to have prepared like hardcore for this um, when this is over, could you explain the GWAS stuff? Um, I, I can, uh, man, I'm not, this is, it's been so long since I've done any of like the race realist shit. Um, if there's people in chat that study this professionally, you can tell me I'm like broadly right or wrong. I think, so GWAS is basically, I think what you're attempting to do is usually, I think traditionally, I think it was used for diseases, but the idea is that you have like, you have like some trait, okay, that T. And you're taking a look at all of these different genomes. And the goal is to try to find like some genetic like markers where you can make hopefully a heavy association between some trait T and then these genetic markers. And I think this is considered like a GWAS. So the idea would be that like, okay, let's say that I do all this and I find all these genetic markers. Okay, cool. If I open up a, uh, if I open up somebody's genome and I take a look and I, I find these same genetic markers, I could probably say that they have this trait. I, I think is like generally, um, I think that's like generally what like a GWAS is, right? Somebody can correct me if I'm. And, and traditionally it's used for things like diseases and whatnot, which is okay, but people want to, but like, um, I say all writers or race realists want to use this stuff for like intelligence or IQ. They want to have like, they want to like be able to make a GWAS for like anything, for any type of like polygenetic trait. Can you spell it? It's like G-A-G-W-A-S. G it's genome wide association something GWAS or, gen or something. A genome wide association studies and approach using genetics research to associate specific genetic variables to particular disease. The method involves scanning the genomes for many different people and looking for genetic markers can be used to predict the presence of a disease. Yeah, okay. I think that's close enough. But people want to be able to do this or say they can do this for things like intelligence, right?
But like, man, dude, once you start, oh, this is a, this is a really hard area. If you don't know anything about this, you're just you're not even treading. You're going to be sinking in this conversation. It's not because there's a correlation between poverty and criminality that this is not this correlation is not ultimately explained by a genetic influence. Well, yeah, but I think the idea between correlation and causation there, I mean, you're doing the heavy lifting on the other part, right? At the end of the day, if it's poverty that is going to be the, the precursor to crime, then those who are impoverished most likely will have lower test scores on whatever like quotient you're trying to give them. They'll have lower IQ scores, obviously, because they are embattled in poverty. That wouldn't surprise me to find that out. That does That's not an indicator that somehow they're genetically predisposed to being poor. Like, I've never heard anyone suggest that, that there happens to be a genetic coding that makes people pop, like impoverished. People have done, like, tried to do genetic associations or correlations with all sorts of things. Um, fucking, we fucking studied the heritability. You can find studies on, like, um, the, um, I think it's even the genetic heritability of your political views, even, I think. Um, like, we, we th this stuff has been, there's all sorts of studies about this. Um, I don't know why you would say that. I don't know why you would say I've never in my life heard of anybody doing associations between genes and poverty. People will study genetic links to almost everything. Yeah, of course they do. Um, uh, but whatever. Well, uh, you can go uh, look why evolution is true. The blog, they have a post recently. The thing that sucks here now also is that anybody that's listening to this debate is if you look up anything JF is saying, everything JF is saying, broadly speaking, is true. So it's going to look like, if you don't know the finer points of what he's talking about, you probably just assume those are true as well, right? The people say... It's 12 o'clock exactly, this must be a test. What do we have sirens for in California, in LA? Siren test, LA. What do they test for? At noon on the first Thursday of every month, it's Friday. Dude, imagine bombing somebody at exactly noon on like the first day or whatever of the month. Nobody, everybody would think it's a drill, right? Not that you should ever do that, of course, in a video game. But like imagine you know there's gonna be like a drill, like, they're gonna do a drill at 2 p.m. on Friday. We're gonna attack at 2 p.m. on Friday. Like that would be like, <laughs> how much confusion would there be there in a video game? Called how much variation in human behavior is due to variation in our gene. Answer, quite a bit. And so the reason you've not been exposed to these ideas is that you've been presumably hanging out in uh, social circles of leftism. Uh, there is seriously no scientific question today that the genes influence all of the factors we talked about, criminality, IQ, educational attainment, wealth. Uh, it's definite. The, the definite answer is yes, and you, you'll see the link to the original peer-reviewed study in that blog post. Are we the important thing there is, the question though is how much does it affect it, right? This is the, this is the, the crucial question. Talk about uh, capitalism or socialism at all? Is is that going to be on the menu? Or? Well, you know, it, it, we're still talking about it. That's the important thing is that we're we're talking about these issues because if evolution applies to humans and it does, and if genes matter to behavior, then socialistic systems, welfare systems, UBI systems are unsustainable over evolutionary times. That is my point tonight, and I, all I hear is adominance, insults, jokes, a guy who recognizes himself that he's a comedian on the internet. Uh, I, I was expecting more. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I was not, so I've been I've been basically met with exactly what my expectations uh, presented. I'll I'll say this though, when it when it comes to all those problems and, and what exactly is the causal link and, and what exactly is going to create, uh, let's say, more poverty in society. Ultimately, you would want to see less, right? I, I'd assume less poverty. Yeah, less less poverty. You, you'd like to see more equality, right? More more people living their best lives. I would assume. Not necessarily, you know, I, I take planet Earth as what it is, you know, when I look at the population, whether it's of animals, of plants or of humans, I don't see something that must be manipulated towards something better because of my taste. 
I don't have that kind of narcissism to think that my preferences over the world should overtake it. I, I see it as a natural system that will develop and that will either sustain or not sustain. And so when I look at humanity, I'm fine with our past, for example. You know, if, if I look at the human population a million years ago, I can imagine that they were living kind of rough lives. And I don't take issue with this. I'm fine with what we are. We are animals. We come from populations of apes, and we are subject to evolution. I'm fine with everything we've went through. And sometimes I think that in what we think is an advance, we are actually directing our societies toward systems that should not be uh, should not be adopted, and that we should yes return to a state that is perhaps more poor but more in line with nature. I mean, from my perspective, I think if we both agree that humans evolve over time, so do economic systems evolve over time, then we should be taking the aspects of those economic systems and then utilizing what works the best and then trying to improve our lives and the lives of everyone around us. Because ultimately, it's not even from like an egotistical thing. It can be from a more like selfish reason. I think everyone's lives are better when everyone is collectively thriving. The more poor Aww. people there are, the more people who are like suffering on the street, the less quality of life you or me is going to have. I mean, the more crime that there's on the street, the more problems everyone else is going to have. If you improve the lives and the conditions of everyone around you, then we will also live better lives. Aww. That's one way to see it. Uh, you know, there were poor times in the past of my... You know what an interesting argument I'd be interested to hear thrown at Jeff? <clears throat> what if there is a phenotype for a poor person and a phenotype for a or a phenotype for a poor dumb person and a phenotype for a, a wealthy intelligent person and that this is what JF is fixated on right what if there was a phenotype for a social helping person and a phenotype for a selfish taking person and what if in JF's world could we argue that JF is selecting for and breeding only like selfish and unwilling to help people and couldn't we argue that humans is like a social being like kind of need people that are willing to give a little to others in order to thrive as a species that maybe in JF's world you would selectively breed and, and apply evolutionary pressure so that only the most selfish and taking and greedy humans exist and then that necessarily causes the collapse of the unsustainability of the human race i don't know maybe i don't i, I would just i'd be curious in hearing his response to that great grandparents that somehow sometimes i think it was still a better time and a better world so it's not all about wealth definitely and there are desirable things of societies of the past that got abolished by the current uh, eccentric lifestyle and the over perfusion of wealth and money and the system and I'm fine with poverty existing. I don't want to combat it because when you start combating it, you start entering the game of unsustainability, the game of feeding the birds, feeding the squirrels. And to me, that's a dangerous path to take. Um, I, I don't know where we move from here, James. Did did we have, do you want to go to the next section or should we? We shall. And so want to say a couple of things folks want to first let you know our guests are linked in the description. We really do appreciate our guests. So want to mention that you can find their links down below. And that includes if you're listening to the Modern Day Debate podcast episode of this debate, as we also put our guest links down in the podcast description for that episode. But also want to let you know, folks, as usual, we ask that you'd be your regular friendly selves, attacking only the arguments and not the person as. We really do appreciate these guys for being with us tonight. And so we are going to jump into the Q&A and also want to let you know, let's see, there it is. All right. Thanks so much. Good on that note. This one coming in from... Uh, Bubblegum Gun says, eugenics is quote-unquote good. It, it's just the stuff people do in the name of eugenics that is bad, just like how socialists do bad things in the name of socialism. Any thoughts, JF? I, I can't tell who this is for well, exactly. Eugenics is happening, whether you like it or not. So you can either be uninformed about it and do it accidentally, in which case you're probably going to have very bad effects on the...
An, like another argument, man, eugenics is like in my, ugh, this is a, okay, we're going back to 2020 optics for a second because optically this argument sounds horrible just because of how fucking stupid most of the people that are gonna listen to this stuff are. Eugenics in and of itself is not a good or a bad thing. Eugenics is just a tool that could be used to achieve some positive end or some negative end. So for example, you might say um, like, you know, only white people are allowed to have kids from now on. Only white people with blue eyes, right? That's like a form of eugenics. It's probably not a good thing, right? But like, let's say that CRISPR evolves to the point to where we can start to selectively edit out, you know, things like Huntington's disease or whatever. That's a form of eugenics, right? Is selectively deciding which traits or genes are passed on or whatever. Um, arguably, I mean, arguably, it's a little bit messier, but some people can have argued that like um, abortion among black people is a form of eugenics, that um, black women like disproportionately get abortions at higher rates than white people do. And like ABL, like some people even in the black community will argue that this is a form of eugenics that's practiced on black poor people, that many of them are um, having abortions and it's, you know, causing a, a, an effect on the number of black babies that are being born or whatever. Um, like th th just... You just one thing I would always say is just like be never get hung up in an argument over like um like is eugenics good or bad? You want to talk about the next step. Like okay, hold on, fuck if you think eugenics is good or bad. What do you want to do? Like tell me what you want to do because that's always going to be the more interesting part of the conversation um, rather than like Lance here is just trying to take um, Lance is just trying to take the optics win on saying eugenics bad. But I think I think you need to go a step further than that if you really want to if if you really want to like fight against that argument world or you can inform yourself and inform your and embed your interventions into society with this knowledge you're going to be much better with the knowledge and i would just like to use this opportunity to quote the article uh, in nature human behavior i was talking about the article showing absolutely strong polygenic signals for lots of human behaviors it's called dissecting polygenic signals from genome-wide association studies on human behavior gotcha and Lance, if you had anything to add, I want to give you a chance if you had anything you want to say. Uh, yeah, sure. Eugenics is bad and you shouldn't do it. Gotcha. And folks, now I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say that we have asked moderators, if you haven't heard, we've asked moderators to not take a position as we are trying to uber maximize our neutrality. And so we have now asked moderators, if you'd be so kind to not debate people in the chat. We do appreciate you moderators. Thank you for everything you do. And Bubblegum Gun with another question. Where says, is the closest JF, furnace? We haven't had capitalism for nearly 200 years. Small government never stays small. Under government, you need welfare. Capitalism can only exist under anarchy. Yes, it's true. All of this is true. But let us return to what were the initial conditions that le led oh, to our fine. current wealth. Let us not abandon and let, let us say, all right, let's rebuild a society on those bases. One for Lance. Pancake of Destiny says, Lance, why should I work when I can do nothing and get the same money as when I would work? Socialism supports, they claim, laziness. And also says, convince me to get a job, Lance, and I'm not in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, socialists don't want people not to work. They want people to work better and more efficiently and uh, have more democracy in the workplace. Um, I, I want to give people more freedom. I want to expand freedom, not just in the voting booth, but actually put it in the place where they work eight hours of their day every single day. That's the idea. Gotcha. And old nemesis of JF's Brenton Langle says more food equals more people is idiotic. The third world has less food and more babies than the first material abundance uh, than, than the Brenton. first world. And then says material abundance is correlated with less kids, not more. Uh, that is that is correct. When I say food, uh, I use it as a very loose analogy for everything that you could plug into someone's life that would lead to them making babies instead of dying on the street. Gotcha. And one for Lance says, this is Sphincter of Doom, says the workplace is already democratized. Every consumer has power over a corporation and everyone is a consumer, even though not everyone is a worker. 
Sure. So the idea that you've got democracy in your uh, voting ability to buy products is actually just an illusion. Because at the end of the day, like I stated, if you look at the five companies, or sorry, I think it's seven companies that produce all the food you buy, uh, it goes down to seven major umbrella corporations that actually. So this is unfortunately just is just not true. Um, this is a fucking furnace. I'm not looking for a furnace. Fuck. People like to make the argument that there's only six or seven companies that you can buy products from because they run everything. That's actually not true. There's tons of small businesses that you could support if you wanted to. The reason why people don't is because it is more expensive. That's the reason. If you wanted to support small businesses and buy food more expensively from like smaller mom and pop shop, you could do it, but people don't because it's more expensive. That's why. That's so. That's actually what's happening. When people try to, people make this weird argument about how, like, oh well, it's just because there's a, you know, only six companies running. Bullshit. There's tons. There's thousands, millions, probably, of businesses in the U.S. Um, you just don't want to support them because they cost more. We own every small major brand that you see in the supermarket. So when you're walking up and down the aisle and you see thousands and thousands of products, and you're like, like, I can vote with my dollar. You're actually just choosing whether or not to give your dollar to seven different companies. There is no evidence income inequality is inherently bad. Singapore has more income inequality than the U.S. and no problems commonly claimed to be caused by income inequality. Wealth is not immutable. Uh, I can't speak directly to, again, uh, Singapore because I'm not uh, as familiar with the things going on there. I can speak to in income inequality uh, in countries like Canada, the United States and Europe and say that it is uh, quite traumatic how we've gotten to this point. Regardless, uh, it doesn't change the fact that globally, again, six uh, white men control uh, the collective wealth of half of the rest of the human race. So I think that is an enormous amount of uh, income uh, inequality. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question coming in from Bubblegum Gun says, Lance, fascism was created by an anarcho syndicalist who was nationalistic. Nationalistic syndicalism was based on the guild system of feudal times. So uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to Hitler and Mussolini uh, and speaking about fascism itself as in the fasciste, which is again referencing to like the, the bundle of sticks logo, if we're getting into that. Uh, but the idea perhaps that we're getting closer to is maybe uh, the fact that the word socialist is in the word Nazis, which seems to be a common trope that pops up on the internet, um, which of course is the very definition of like a misnomer. At the end of the day, um, it's uh, the democratic people's... Uh, <laughs> I can't believe Wolf did the... Well, they call themselves socialists. I believe they're socialists. Really, Wolf? What about Nazis? Well, you see, that's actually completely different. A party of China. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're in any way democratic. Uh, and the same thing applies to the Nazis themselves. They were not socialist. Gotcha. And Sphincter of Doom says, Poverty is only a good predictor of crime when you ignore any other factor. Further, absolute poverty is what is relevant as a predictor, not relative poverty. So again, inequality doesn't matter for you, Lance. Um, well, I, I would be um, basically... Uh... My understanding is that um, inequality in and of itself can actually be a predictor for um, like social unrest or whatever that even if everybody has rel uh, like absolutely decent levels of wealth if there's high inequality between people that are like in close proximity to each other that that in and of itself is actually sufficient to um like cause problems which was surprising to me i'd have to go back and look it up but uh, referring myself to people who have spent a lot more time studying this than, than me, uh, especially uh, large left-wing pinko commie organizations like the International Monetary Fund, who have said that the largest precursor for crime happens to be poverty itself. Uh, and that, to me, makes sense just on the surface, let alone if the actual statistics bear it out. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Meduse NCO says, Lance, please explain why I'm entitled to any of Bezos's benefits that he earned by inventing they put it in all caps amazon all that leads to is people being reluctant to innovate so uh i don't know if you work for amazon because that would be a different thing if you're just an everyday citizen i don't think you're entitled to anything that amazon the company earns otherwise that would be a little silly but i think every single person who works for amazon is entitled to a certain percentage of that company i also think it would ameliorate the conditions of the workers if they had access to that and finally i don't think that jeff bezos does uh you know five hundred thousand or whatever the actual multiplication uh, version of the work of his employees is i'm not saying that it's not much more difficult to be a ceo than it is to be perhaps a warehouse worker uh, although it is pretty fucking 
shitty to be a warehouse worker these days when you have to literally shit and piss in bags and in cans and stuff like that. So uh, I think if you were, were to have a hierarchy of that kind, you would have to justify it. Uh, and I don't think in any way Jeff Bezos has. Gotcha. And Sphincter of Doom strikes again saying, Apparently, just apparently the pee and bottle thing is real. I don't believe that delivery drivers are shitting in bags. I don't think that's real. There was one email that went out one time at one warehouse about this that I saw, but whoever was doing that was either pranking or they were fucking mentally ill. I don't think that normal people shit in fucking bags while driving. That's like, I, no. <laughs> I love how JF has been sweating bullets because of how wrong he is. Then says, also, there are no peer-reviewed papers correlating genes with poverty, IQ, and crime, but that poverty affects genes and crime rates. Well, uh, first, yes, I'm sweating tonight. That's because the summer is starting here. And uh, on so my it's okay. time... I'm standing beside my farming rig, which includes four levels of different illumination. I'm producing a lot of heat right now, but it's all for growing my plants. Uh, so I'm paying a price, but ultimately to get the benefits of this labor later this summer when I harvest my plants, tomatoes, squashes, peppers, all kinds of stuff. Now, as far as there's no study that shows correlation between genes and poverty and genes and, and other things, uh, the study I named it, uh, it is, uh, let me just go back to the title, go see dissecting polygenic signals from genome-wide association studies on human behavior in nature human behavior and he seems to suggest that somehow the correlations between poverty and something else undermines this genetic link no to to the contrary uh, this article looks at the genetic correlation between these multiple variables and show that ultimately you have things that you may consider very differently things like number of sexual partners and do you have adhd or do you have autism and it shows the partial genetic correlation explaining both and in many cases you have genetic correlations explaining both rather than one causing the other in the social or cultural domain. Gotcha, and thank you very much for this question. Coming in from Super K-Pill, says, Lance, poverty and, in and inequality are two different things. Next up, this one coming in from Brenton Langle, says, JF is not qualified to talk about human genes. His PhD was in neuroscience. His thesis was on lampreys. He is no more qualified regarding humans than Lance. There is no matter of qualification other than the facts that we are able to spout. And the facts that I'm able to spout are based in twin studies, GWAS studies. It doesn't matter who I am. I could be Lens and be quoting these studies and I'd be right. But it turns out I'm a biologist who's also a theorician in evolutionary biology. I have experience working on genetic populations of monkeys at Duke University. And I've also worked in the private sector research in clinical psychiatry, specifically the genetic origins of patients' response to different levels of psychiatric uh, medication uh, in relation to their genes. So I know what I'm talking about, but you don't have to believe me on this. You just have to look at the facts and Dra and drag your own conclusions or if you have if you have facts that are contradicting me show them can i can i respond to that one as well sure uh he taught monkeys how to play video games jf did well yep. yes i did wow well is that a problem <laughs> super interesting no it's it's incredibly based robert yeah it's absolutely Fantastic. I feel lucky in my life that I've been close enough to these rhesus macaques that I could train them into playing soccer, literally, on a PC game that I had programmed myself. Wow. Amazing. Robert Anderson says, the serfs, socialism slash communism is built on eugenics. Have you not been listening to anything JF has been saying? Um, 
I mean, I hadn't heard that argument until today. Uh, this was the first time I'd been introduced to it. Uh, I'm certainly taking it in uh, for what it is. And um, I'll have to add it to uh, my lexicon of new ideas that I've been exposed to. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Kevin De La Riva. Thank you for your questions at Lance. Why do you want to slow down economic growth and allow China to pass us up? Uh, China has already passed you in terms of their uh, GDP growth rate, and they will pass you economically in about six years. Question for JF. You think that because twin studies show economic failure can be caused by genetics, eugenics... Oh, okay, so they're saying... You think that because twin studies show economic failure can be caused by genetics, that therefore eugenics is good, but pores with poor people with good genes do exist. You're, you're mixing my statements up and misinterpreting them in just small ways. First, what the twin study shows is that human outcome in our societies are influenced by genetics. That's a fact. The second statement, I never said that I'm for eugenics. I'm saying everyone is committing eugenics. No matter how you change society, you end up having a eugenic effect. So all I'm saying is let's be conscious of the eugenics we, effects we have and let's manage them in the most efficient way so that we direct our society in the direction that we find is the most sustainable and moral to us. And third, uh, you mentioned at the end of the super chat, what was it? They said, but poor people with good genes do exist. Yeah. Yeah, and so they should uh, they should let their sperm and eggs compete on the sexual market. We'll see how good they are. <laughs> gotcha. Sigur of Doom says, quote, choosing from seven different companies, unquote, is still literally choosing, Lance. They say not having infinite choices or all the choices you want doesn't preclude democracy. Otherwise, democracy would never exist. It's absolutely true. I'm saying the fundamental problem is that these numbers keep getting smaller. Like when I was a kid, uh, I believe there was more than eight or nine media companies that controlled all the media we consumed. They hadn't like coalesced into this big five that we find ourselves now. I mean, eventually, uh, Jeff Bezos just got MGM, I think, the other day for for like to the tune of what sixteen million dollars. Like eventually, it's going to be Disney, uh, Amazon, and maybe one other provider. Maybe. Wait, did MGM Studios sell for only sixty million dollars? Eight point four five billion. Okay, eight billion. That sounds closer to okay. Be <laughs> Netflix if they can hold out, uh, and then it'll be just two, and then maybe eventually one. Like I'm, I'm fundamentally opposed to monopolies dominating entire realms of food or music or art or anything really, like even airlines or or, or beer. Like I think that's a huge problem. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Space Ace One Seven Zero says, "Could we ask?" JF, how capitalism can work to punish billionaire criminals, a la Jeffrey Epstein. Oh, well, it's quite simple. Uh, crimes must be pursued and they must be put in jail. So as long as you have a solid service to apply the law, it should apply to billionaires as much as it applies to uh, people who are poor. And sometimes there may be disequilibrium. I think in the Jeff Epstein case, there's even a story of him uh, of him succeeding at buying out uh, a case against him. Uh, in, in exchange, he didn't have much punishment, if any. So definitely there's a problem there. And it's all about the morality of our law makers and our law pliers and how do you fix this that's a tough problem because ultimately they they seem to be easy to corrupt is it true that you accepted a twenty five thousand dollar donation from jeffrey epstein to start uh, your channel it's true but i don't like uh saying the word accepted what i like to say is i took twenty five thousand dollars from jeff epstein mm -hmm. so i mean welfare is okay if it comes from jeffrey epstein then well, it's not welfare since it was a voluntary transaction. And my thinking as far as this goes is uh, I, had, I had to have some fun to start my YouTube channel. 
and there he was and any money that i took from him would go less into his pedophilic uh interactions and so if you will i consider my taking of 25k from him as having kept bad actions from happening in the world <laughs> you were saving the kids essentially yes i mean maybe not to the point of getting a nobel peace prize but almost this one you coming heard that in, academy this one coming in from dennis ridolfi jr says workers making all decisions ever went to a union contract talk people are simpletons yeah uh, and uh, I mean, the same argument can be put forth for uh, democracy itself, for people voting in their elections, for the example of like them voting for Donald Trump. I was deeply upset about that. I was really upset when they voted for Stephen Harper here in Canada. Uh, but that doesn't change the fundamental principle that I think they should have the right to that democracy. That doesn't just because I don't like the results of what someone comes up with doesn't mean that I should take those uh, powers away from them. Gotcha. And this question coming in from Sphincter of Doom says, if co-ops need special treatment to compete, they are not actually competitive. Sorry, if co-ops need what to compete? They said if they need special treatment to compete, then they're not oh, actually competitive. Uh, well, I'm not asking for special treatment in any way, shape, or form. I'm saying, oh, are you talking about how the, I want... I think it was. You did. He said there needs to be incentives from the government, special incentives. Government investment in them. We have government investment right now in capitalist ventures all the time in, in a variety of forms. I, I'm just saying that that should be also extended uh, towards worker cooperatives too. What's available to capitalist firms that aren't available to cooperatives? I don't understand what he means by that. Other than cooperatives literally selling, uh, selling um, equity, of course. Gotcha. And Vince says, if JF believes in eugenics for preserving intelligence... Do you know Epstein funded JF's first YouTube video series? Yeah, this is a meme a long, long time ago, yeah. Why did he attempt to have... Let's see... Or no, I say a meme, but it, it, it actually happened. It was a real meme. An actual thing, yeah. Plant JF all his premises. If we get advanced enough AI, it trumps all. His arguments against welfare and for eugenics based on evolution. Uh, AI doesn't solve evolution. Really, you evolve as long as you make babies and as long as you have mutations in your genes. So no matter how, what kind of supercomputer would control humanity, there would be people advantaged by this supercomputer and there would be people punished by it. So as long as, uh, unless the computer can determine that you can only make two babies, in which case it would essentially be a fascistic central control of human reproduction, which I don't think is desirable. But other than this, evolution continues into humanity, no matter the state of informatics and how far advanced the computers are. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Mars. Appreciate it. It says supposedly, quote unquote, atheist leftists, put even the worst and most extreme Christian fundamentalists to shame in their total denial of evolution and genetics. Is that a question or just a comment? Some of these are just comments. Uh, I think they're saying, I can read it again. I don't know if you, if you need me to though. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really have a comment on that. Gotcha. And this one coming in from Michael Lyon says, Anarcho-capitalism is the only morality. Should someone have the right to take from you because you worked hard for it? Uh, I assume that's to me. Yep. So the problem with that system is that, A, ideally, you're going to already be in a position of wealth, as in you maybe inherited wealth from your family or you have something to that effect. Uh, B, uh, you're going to be completely able-bodied. You've got no uh, you know, physical detriment to you that would make you unable to work. You aren't old. You aren't uh, too young. Uh, anything of that sort. And then at the end of the day, uh, we're all going to be placing each other uh, in competition with each other. So the problem being is that the way our classification and stratification of society is now, not everyone gets uh, a fair shake. You know, you, you have but to look to the differences between the white and black experience in America. And even to this day, uh, you know, black people on average have a harder time getting bank loans when they're trying to start businesses. Uh, black people on average have a harder time getting hired for positions. If they have black sounding names, they won't even get like a first call back. So there is a way in which society already judges us uh, that wouldn't really work if all of a sudden we abolish the government and just let capitalism run amok and have this kind of like free market utopia. 
Gotcha, Bubblegum Gun says based and anarcho capitalist gamer monkey pilled. Next, I don't know. Manamer, Manimer, thank you for your question. Says JF. Based. They say you you say you aren't in favor of eugenics, so how would you benefit by establishing an ethno state? Something you were on record calling for. If you don't believe in superiority and inferiority of these different uh, people groups, why separate by race? Well, you know, as I said, eugenics, I say it happens whether you believe, whether you care about it or not. So evolution goes on. You just need to know this as you implement systems of society. Now, uh, the other question about creating a state and should a state be to the service of its people or should it be open? Uh, my thinking around this is simply that this, the function of a state is to form a social contract between the humans who are currently living and binding also their descendants. And I do not think that a state has obligations uh, toward people who are outside of it or people who are unrelated to its founders or the people who were in it at the moment of founding. Now, in my view of the state, the state should be so, so reduced that it really doesn't matter. Uh, but it's important to, w when you say that the things I've said in the past, uh, those are based around a concern that the Constitution should protect the people who form it and should maintain its continuity into the future. Gotcha. Bert Kreischer's fake laugh says, Lance, you tried to lead JF down paths, but they worked against you. You had, <sighs> gosh. Uh, they said, you have a devastatingly poor showing here. Oh, that's that's it? Uh, I'll, I'll try harder next time. Maybe maybe if I can get my own $25,000 cash injection from Jeffrey Epstein, I'll be able to perform better in this debate. Maybe I can put you together with uh, Justin Maxwell. Hey, whatever it takes. Next up. Here, here for that welfare. Sphincter of Doom says, monopolies are a product of regulatory capture, not capitalism, Regulatory capture is a function of regulatory power. Is that one to me? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Regulatory ca uh, capitalism is, is a form of regulatory power. I, I assume you might be talking about the idea of crony capitalism. And while people like to point that out as being the, the problem with society, if just only there weren't a few bad capitalists, everything would work out. When it seems to me, as these cycles and these systems perpetuate themselves, they seem to be siphoning more and more money into the hands of the very few. So it seems to be pretty indicative of where the system is going. Why can't we ever say the same for socialist systems? People are like, oh, you call that crony capitalism? Wrong. That's just all capitalism. Well, what happened with China? Well, that wasn't real socialism. Well, what happened with the USSR? Well, that wasn't real socialism. Well, what happened? Like, okay, well, that socialism has never been tried for. I was like, okay, dude. Gotcha. And that, oh, we had one more. I think this is for you, JF. We haven't had a lot for you. Hello, Hella Baluba says, JF stated he embraces eugenics. Does he also believe that eugenics should be used to select for certain people groups? Well, again, there's this misconception that I support eugenics when I really don't. Uh, I think that trust human built institutions are typically terrible at doing the right kind of eugenics and that nature is actually the best source of the best natural selection pressures and so no i'm i'm not for eugenics i'm not for selecting features in humanity by any sort of force any sort of central control or any force of state state intervention gotcha and with that i want to say folks we appreciate our do you have any thoughts on large conglomerates owning more and more and shrinking ownership? How would capitalism mitigate that or is that not a problem? I just don't have the background to speak on this. I don't understand fundamentally what the fuck antitrust means in the eyes of the US government. I don't know. Like one thing that will always confuse me and maybe somebody has a good answer and then I'll be like, oh, I understand and I can explain this to people. Like why the fuck was Facebook allowed to buy Instagram? That's like, what, like I just, I, I don't fundamentally understand what, what antitrust law is supposed to be in the United States. I totally don't fucking get it. Or like, I don't understand like why, like, I don't know how long I would, I don't know how far I would run this argument down, but like, I don't know why multi-billion dollar corporations are allowed to buy anything. Like, why should Amazon be allowed to buy any other company ever? <laughs> should they? Like, why? 
Like, does Amazon need to buy like Whole Foods? Like, aren't you just establishing like vertical monopolies at that point? Do we not? Do we care about vertical monopolies, or do we not care about vertical monopolies? Like, I don't know. It's just like I, 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 I have a fundamental misunderstanding of like those types of competitive or anti-competitive rulings. I, I just, yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand that. I'm not sure. I personally, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't like this idea of enriching your company through acquisition of other companies. That seems weird to me, um, but I don't feel I'm not married to that idea. You know, somebody could probably pretty easily argue me out of that if they have like a like, oh, well, this is why it's a good idea. But like the idea that like the obsession to make a company and then sell it immediately or other companies growing themselves by acquiring other companies, it just um, that just seems weird to me. I don't like that. It, it feels unhealthy or anti-competitive or just not like a way that you would want like an open market running. What makes you so uncomfortable about it? Um, it just seems like a bad, it just seems like it tends towards like a very, very, very high concentration of power. Like for a lot of business owners in Silicon Valley. So here's what, here's what maybe you guys think, or maybe what people used to think. And I'll tell you what people actually think. Okay. Here's what people think. Okay. People think that People in Silicon Valley's dreams are, I'm going to make a company that rivals Facebook and Amazon. That's what people think they think. What they actually think is, I'm going to make a company that I can sell to Facebook or Amazon. That's what people actually think. And I, that feels like a not, that's not like a good competitive environment, right? Like, I don't know. That just seems, it just seems weird to me. Supposing corporate buyer was made illegal and the big company wants to internally expand into a new area, is it okay for them to poach talent slash buy IP from smaller companies? I just, I'm not sure how I feel about the concept of having these like Omega companies that branch out and do like 10 different things. Like, I don't know if they should be allowed to. Like, does it make sense that Yamaha makes like saxophones and motorcycles and whatever else they make? Like, I, I don't know. These like huge companies that ha like dip their toes into 35 different arenas. I don't know. I just don't know how I feel about that or Samsung or LG or whatever. Why not? Um, because I think that for capitalism to work best, we probably want quite a bit of decentralization of power from any individual player and limiting a corporation's ability to like thrive in other unrelated areas probably would increase the amount of like competitors in a market, right? Like the more people that are bidding or asking in a market, the ideally the more liquidity, the healthier market is, right? To be honest, Yamaha has no business making instruments out of wood. Their guitars have always looked something bizarre, but I think their brass, wind instruments, and general audio electronic equipment are good. I think Yamaha is, at least for saxophones, I think Yamaha makes some of the best saxophones in the world. Like it's considered like a, a like you can get a Yamaha, you can get a like a Selmer, like like Yamaha saxophones at the very least are very, 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 very good horns. Uh, I don't know, I can't speak to any other brass instrument, but um, they make, oh yeah, and they, I think they, do they do drums as well? Wait, and they do pianos, don't they? Am I crazy? Is there, are there like really nice like Yamaha Grands? Or am I just thinking of, yeah, I don't know. That's just weird to me. Are you okay with businesses creating products to enter a market like Apple going from computers to phones? Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't like the Omega company shit. It just seems weird. It seems anti-competitive. How do you feel about holding companies? I think holding companies usually exist to kind of like work around like weird tax or business laws or things or whatever, right? Acquisitions help with price discovery and that's why shareholders like it. Price, the price discovery of what? Of the company being acquired? Because it seems like acquisition at that point would be a little anti-price discovery because once the company's acquired, it no longer has a price, right? Because now it's just bought in and absorbed by the other company. I mean, price discovery can still happen with just normal investment. Like companies still need valuations to raise capital, right? But the other company is still publicly traded. If the acquisition is dilutive, then the shareholders of the acquired company will be punished. Huh. Man, he launched himself. I've heard of weird acquisition strategies. I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard of weird acquisition strategies being used to like theoretically manipulate or artificially temporarily inflate stock values. So like you might have a company that's worth like 
$25 billion and they acquire some other company for 10 or $20 million, but the news of that acquisition drives the market cap and the other stock price like so much higher that the, the company's valuation becomes higher, or the market capitalization of the acquiring company becomes higher than what they just spent on the acquisition. Like weird stuff like that can happen. Uh, I, I don't know like how all of that plays out in the real world. Like, I've, I've just heard of like dumb shit like this. Remember to hit that like and subscribe and don't forget the notification bell so that my videos show up right in your feed. I don't care about your moral offense, you piece of shit. You convinced her to leave her family without a, without a word to join you and make a baby. That's, That's wrong. called love, you idiot.